technology. Today, when we think of technology, we instantly think of the tools that are integrated into our everyday routines, and essentially they're there to make life easier for us, like a TV, a microwave, an air conditioner, a laptop, a camera, Beats headphone, an iPhone. The list continues on and on and on and on and on. Sometimes we don't even think twice about what technology does for us every day. We even take it for granted. Technology now is as natural to us as it is riding a bike. We think of technology as a means to an end as well as a human activity. But what exactly the f is technology? What do all technological things have in common? We are going to discover what exactly technology is in Martin Heidegger's The Question Concerning Technology. I'll try to keep the Heidegger-isms to a limit by trying to simplify his concepts, as well as make this an enjoyable presentation for you as it is for me. So yes, technology is a means to an end, otherwise known as the instrumental, and a human activity, otherwise known as the anthropological. Is this statement enough for Heidegger? No, of course not. It's Heidegger. He says, yes. It is technically correct, but not adequate enough to define what technology really is. So in order for us to fully comprehend technology, we need to have a free relationship to it. And we will discuss exactly what Heidegger means by that later on. It is also important that in Heidegger's world that we do not view technology the way we think of it currently, which are instrumentums or tools or aids, such as the iPhone, glasses, or even Donald Trump's toupee. But instead, we are seeking technology's essence. It is crucial for Heidegger and also for us that we know that technology does not equal to technology's essence. When we discover technology's essence, we discover the commonality that all technologies share. But let's rewind a bit. Technology is a means to an end and a human activity. But suppose now that technology were no mere means, how would it stand with the will to master it? We will not find its essence if we think conceptually, but rather we need to approach this metaphysically. Heidegger moves away from this idea of instrumental versus anthropological, and now we dig deeper into his philosophical side. Wherever there's an effect, there is a cause. Technology is an instrumentum, so wherever instrumentality reigns, there reigns causality. Heidegger now dives into Aristotle's metaphysics of causality, otherwise known as the four causes. Heidegger uses the silver chalice as an example in explaining these causes. So first we have the causa materialis, the matter or material of which it is made, and in this case we have the silver. Secondly, we have the causa formalis, the logos or form structure in which it is shaped, in this case the chalice curved form. Thirdly, the causa ficiens, the source of the change or rest that brings about what is made, in this case the silversmith. And last but not least, the fourth cause, the causa finalis, the final effect and reason of why it is made, in this case, the sacrificial rite. And voila, what is revealed? The silver chalice. Heidegger often refers to the unconcealment. We bring forth from nothing. We think of an idea and make it into something tangible. Unconcealment equals althea. Althea is Greek for truth. Technology is a mode of revealing. Technology comes to presence in the realm where revealing and unconcealment take place, where Althea, truth, happens. We introduce meaning where there used to be a vague conception. But how is technology revealing? Heidegger infers that we must think of revealing or bringing forth as poesis, not only handicraft manufacture, not only artistic and poetical bringing into appearance and concrete imagery is a bringing forth poesis. In other words, we must be sensitive and so to speak poetic to what is, for what presences are laid out before us. Another important term Heidegger mentions is the word techne, which is skill, technique, and also the arts of the mind and the fine arts. Techne belongs to bringing forth to poesis. It is something poetic. When one encompasses both poesis and techne, one can reveal to us. So based on all of this information, is it safe to say that technology's essence is that it reveals althea, or truth, to us? Mm. According to Heidegger, yes, but no. Heidegger uses the silver chalice to convey causality, but can this concept apply to modern technology? Modern technology goes beyond causality, and it has also changed the pattern, revealing something quite different and radically new. What is modern technology? It is too revealing. Only when we allow our attention to rest on this fundamental characteristic does that which is new in modern technology show itself to us. 
So are we only worried about technology, the essence of technology, because we are scared of what we created into the world? This is one of the fundamental questions that Heidegger tries to find an answer to. How is modern technology any different? There is something very distinctive about modern technology. We go farther away from poesis and more towards techne, in which the revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that is supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. Unlike earlier times when man simply brings forth, today man challenges forth. In other words, we use and manipulate the resources nature gives to us to manufacture, to create, or to reveal technology that is man-made. However, Heidegger goes on to say that although the windmill is a technological device made by man, the idea of challenging does not apply here. Instead, the wind is left as is. Yes, we use it for energy, but the windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. The windmill is technology that satisfies human without hurting nature, and what Heidegger imposes here is that perhaps we need more of these technologies. Then on the other end of the spectrum, man challenges resources when he mines coal or when he cultivates his farm soil. Agriculture is now the mechanized food industry. Air is now set upon to yield nitrogen, the earth to yield ore, or to yield uranium. For example, uranium is set upon to yield atomic energy, which can be released either for destruction or for peaceful use. When we challenge nature's resources, we always want the maximum yield at the minimum expense. So what do we also do? We store energy if we are not using it. Such challenging happens in that the energy concealed in nature is unlocked. What is unlocked is transformed. What is transformed is stored up. What is stored up is in turn distributed and what is distributed is switched about ever anew. According to Heidegger, these are always a revealing, but it is revealing that never comes to an end. Now this is where it gets tricky. Heidegger often uses the term bestand or the standing reserve to essentially describe how man perceives resources. Man no longer sees them for what they actually are, but instead sees them as ways to fulfill man's needs. Heidegger uses the Rhine, a famous European river, as an example. He argues that man no longer sees the Rhine for what it is, which is a large body of water, a river, so we don't see it as this, or this, or this. But instead, we see the Rhine as this, this, and this. Instead, a hydroelectric plant is set into the current of the Rhine to produce electricity for man. Man does not see the river's natural tendencies, but rather only sees the power it will give to him. And therefore, he sees it as a standing reserve. Another term Heidegger frequently uses is gestell, or inframing. We challenge and see things as standing reserves because we are constantly inframing everything around us. And framing means the gathering together of that setting upon, which sets upon man, i.e. challenges him forth, to reveal the real in the mode or ordering as standing reserve. When we inframe, we unconceal the standing reserve. We lose sight of the things that do not fit in the standing reserve category back into concealment. When we inframe, as humans, we always view how nature should fit with us instead of viewing how we should fit with nature. We are a very narcissistic race in general. Heidegger says that instead of allowing nature as geet or to give and to reveal on its own terms bringing forth, we inframe and take its resources for granted and appropriate them as standing reserves. When we see this, we actually see this. When we see this, we actually see this. And when we see this, we unfortunately see this. We are questioning concerning technology in order to bring to light our relationship to its essence. And framing is the essence of modern technology. Does this mean that we see the entire world as our standing reserve? Let's look at a contemporary example that eloquently addresses the standing reserve, gestell or framing, and also Heidegger's concerns about the danger of technology. Out there, there's a world outside of Yonkers. Way out there beyond this hick town, Barnaby. There's a slick town, Barnaby, out there, full of shine and full of sparkle. Close your eyes and see it. Listen, Barnaby. Listen, Barnaby. Put on your Sunday clothes. There's lots of world out there. Brilliant team and dime cigars. We're going 
on the pine and venture in the evening air. Girls in white and a perfume night with the lights are bright as the stars. Put on your Sunday clothes, we're gonna ride through town in one of those new horse-drawn open cars. We'll see the shows at Delmonico's and we'll close the town in a world. garbage in your face? There's plenty of space out in space. B&L Starliners leaving each day. We'll clean up the mess while you're away. The jewel of the B&L fleet, the Axiom. Spend your five-year cruise in style, waited on 24 hours a day by our fully automated crew, while your captain and autopilot chart a course for non-stop entertainment, fine dining, and with our all-access hover chairs, even Grandma can join the fun. There's no need to walk. The Axiom, putting the star in Executive Starliner. Because at B&L, space is the final fun here! We see how even at the peak of human survival, we still use or inframe the universe as an alternate home. We've completely destroyed Mother Earth because we continue to inframe and see it as our standing reserve. Where inframing reigns, there's danger in the highest sense. We see the danger that technology has on the world today, like pollution, the extinction of animals and global warming. The amount of stuff and garbage we accumulate over time can very well be a scene right out of Wally. -E. Heidegger conveys that technology can work against us, that not only are we harming nature, we are also harming ourselves. But going back to Poesis, 
Heidegger also infers that since inframing is also a way of revealing, man also has the power to save. But where danger is grows, the saving power also poetically dwells man upon this earth. Fundamentally, if we realize how our orientation fits with the world and realize that we inframe the world around us, we can save ourselves from the damage inframing has done. When we do this, we achieve a free relationship with technology. Yes, according to Heidegger, we cannot escape the fate of technology, but we should always question technology in order to avoid such catastrophes such as global warming. We must question how to use technology without hurting the world around us. We need to go back to not only encompassing techne, but also encompassing more poesis. Heidegger surmises that the human race as a whole need to be more like poets in bringing forth. As poets or artists, we need to see the world for what it is because art and poetry also reveals Althea. Althea is truth, and technology reveals just that. With this unconcealment, we can use technology to also save us from technology. The closer we come to the danger, the more brightly do the ways into the saving power begin to shine, and the more questioning we become, for questioning is the piety of thought.